Aloha mamas and welcome to the mama mindset podcast episode number 12. I thought today would be a fun time to talk about March 30th is doctor's day. I know it's March 31st now, but it's kind of a reflection for me. And since a big part of mama mindset for me comes out of my experiences as a physician, I also, for me, wanted to make a video entry about my journey to Dr. Dumb and my calling in medicine and what the path to that looked like and how I'm leaning more and more into what a healer looks like for me today and the, how that allows me to show up even more authentically in my own skin within mama mindset. And so I, when I think back to my desire to pursue medicine, some of my earliest memories playing soccer growing up, I remember being in Seminole on Seminole County soccer fields, which is this County outside of Orlando. And I think I was on a breakaway or I was about 12 years old, 10 to 12. And I got tripped from behind and I fell forward my outstretched right hand and had not quite a compound fracture where the bones are protruding from your skin, but a very complex fracture where clearly the anatomy of the arm was not going in the right directions. And it was really jarring and traumatic for my teammates to see it. And I initially didn't feel the pain until then some of the fight or flight kicked in, but then the pain was super severe. And I remember the ambulance ride from the soccer game to the hospital and how every single little bump was so excruciating. And at the ER, my parents friend who was an orthopedic surgeon was so gracious. And he came in on a Saturday because that was the day of the game. And I remember that he saved me from having to undergo a surgery on my arm. He, they tried to medicate me, but the pain was so severe. And then they set my arm. So kind of, I remember them taking it in like a circular motion and then setting it and getting the bones aligned. And I don't have, you know, now the physician in me wants to see those x-rays and, and review the injury, but you know, it's definitely a radial, uh, fracture of some kind, maybe even one or two, but I remember being so impressed by that experience and the, the gratitude that I had that to be able to avoid surgery. And I think in the coming years, when doing projects about career and what I wanted to pursue, I remember making this kind of doll figure. And in the middle, it said, I want to be the USA women's national soccer team, sports medicine, orthopedic doctor. And flash forward to today and being a sports medicine doctor and being able to care for athletes of all sports. Uh, but it was fun in my fellowship year caring for the college soccer athletes at university of Hawaii um, here in the Aloha state just brought me full circle back and how you can manifest those dreams at a young age and how we live, we live into those. And so that was super cool. Uh, and as I pursued, went through, you know, the rest of my kind of growing up years to 18, uh, in winter park, Florida, outside of Orlando, I went to public high school. I went to private school up through eighth grade, a small Christian school and, loved playing soccer there. I would literally play soccer at recess every day. And with the boys did not, was not resonating with hanging out with like the girl groups or any of the cliques forming in middle school. I remember doing my homework and being super studious and loving it, working ahead in different like Latin workbooks. I was always really interested in the Latin language. And I think maybe that played into medicine for me too. Learning has always been something that resonates with me in a, in a deep soulful level. I, when I'm learning, I feel like I'm alive and living into the gifts that God put in my heart. And so I remember even in middle school, which is rough for all of us. And for me, it was kind of a chosen, I chose not to fit into any of the groups because I, I didn't feel aligned with the, with that. And I also knew that what brought me joy was playing soccer and studying. And I did those things, um, 
you know, it's definitely ob- lonely at times. And I can share in another podcast, like in middle school, I had, I did suffer panic attacks and really extreme anxiety. And that was really challenging for me. Uh, however, going to counseling and learning more about my thought distortions and gaining the confidence to trust my body, trust my intuition and pivot from those, the paths that would, you know, lead me towards more extreme anxiety was a very empowering, strengthening trial to endure. And I know it's helped me in my life moving forward and giving me more compassion and empathy for other people. Uh, because I feel like we all as humans will go through times of anxiety and I went through severe anxiety at a young age. And so it was very enlightening for me to, to deal with that. And I think I'm a wounded healer. I think we all have the opportunity to be, to be wounded healers in ways that are impactful to other people based on the different traumas and different challenges and trials that we've been through. And that was one of mine. And I look forward to talking about it more. Uh, and I just had this desire to go to the public high school in our town because I wanted to play soccer there. My parents had gone there when they were younger. And I just really desired more diversity in all honesty from my, the private school that I was going to, I wanted to meet people that, you know, weren't like me and just learn more about different religions. And it would just really appeal to me. And so, because it was out of my zoning district, I had to test in an interview for the international baccalaureate program. It's called IB for short. It's kind of like AP classes, but it's a different, it's a curriculum taught all over the world. It's very rigorous. And I pursued that for the four years that I went to winter park high school and played soccer. And so that those dreams came true. And I loved psychology, a blend of psychology and the sciences biologies going through high school. So that always still stuck with me by the time I landed at university of Miami for, for college, I knew I wanted to pursue pre-med. And so I chose neuroscience as a major and it was, I remember it was 130 credits instead of 120. And I still challenged myself to get those accomplished in four years. And it was really challenging while playing uh, collegiate soccer for four years and then also being on a bunch of road trips and missing things. I remember traveling um, on bus and plane trips and you know, teaching myself uh, organic chemistry. I had this textbook in addition to the book that we had for class that was called Organic Chemistry as a Second Language. And that's truly what I felt like organic chemistry was for me. And I... And I can remember that with other things too, like calculus too. I I thought to myself, I feel like the way that this is taught literally hasn't changed since ancient times, like probably Socrates and Aristotle and the Greek minds of that day taught calculus in a similar way. If they, if they taught calculus to how I'm learning it, (laughs) and it was, I remember it just like did not come alive to me. And I sat myself in the math lab and tried to learn from my teachers off hours and just willed myself through the pre-medical curriculum as a prerequisite for medical school to come. And I mean, did really enjoy learning and a lot of the arts and humanities that I got to take as well. And then when I graduated from college, I remember going to Europe with my dad because my sister was studying abroad over there um, in this really cool town on the border of Switzerland and Italy. And I was studying on the trains for the MCAT. The MCAT is your, like the entrance test into medical school. And I took the MCAT at the end of that summer. And it was like a pretty average, low to average score. And I applied broadly and did not get into medical school the first time. And so, you know, this was probably my first experience in life with having a plan, executing, and then it not going, you know, according to plan, so to speak. And so this was the first time a season of adversity kind of came upon me and I was invited into a space of, okay, well, how am I going to react to this? What am I going to do next? And I went to work for my dad at the family business that had been passed down from his dad in life insurance for a year. I remember there was some part of me that was like, okay, you know, if this business isn't pursued by my sister or I, and it won't remain in the family. How, how will that be just the people pleaser me and, and like loving my family of origin 
immensely. And I knew that it wasn't like the ultimate fit for me. And what I loved about that year was, uh, in life insurance with the health exams. And there is a, a big, uh, parallel with, with medicine. And so notice myself gravitating toward that aspect again. And I then continued to pursue additional post-baccalaureate classes that I felt like would enhance my application for medical school. So I went to the university of central Florida and took biochemistry class and some more chemistry classes and went to another MCAT class. And there was like a formal course through Kaplan and it was like really intensive and studied for the MCAT. I am actually a little fuzzy on this historical fact, but I think I took the MCAT a second time. And again, the scores were slightly better, but not competitive enough to land me in medical school after a second round. And so, you know, I rebooted again because I was still really passionate about pursuing medical school. And by this time I was coaching soccer, which was really cool. Full circle for me. I was coaching in the same club that I had played at in, in uh, high school myself. And here I was like head coach of this, um, middle school going into high school group of girls who I love and adore. And that was great for me in training as a pediatrician, learning to, um, connect with and empathize with adolescents and help, um, their, their evolving character and, and also work with the parents because a huge part of pediatrics is interfacing and empowering the parents. And that was a role in coaching that really helped, um, give me a dress rehearsal and give me those skills and insight into that. And so I was working those two jobs to help put myself through grad school. By then I had started and decided to pursue a master's in mental health counseling, which is a two and a half year program I did at university of central Florida. And this was a beautiful side of me that I was able to honor that I really love connecting people and empathizing with people. And so pursuing this counseling degree allowed for the coolest classes that I just love taking. I got to participate in individual and group counseling and lead those and learn a lot about a lot of things, addiction, medicine, and play therapy. I got a certificate in play therapy and also in family, uh, marriage and family therapy. And those I think are just wonderful, wonderful ways I loved serving. And as part of my culminating toward the graduation, part of that master's degree, I did a year internship, 900 hours at I was able to get it again at Arnold Palmer, which was this pediatric hospital that I love so much in central Florida and Orlando. It's affiliated with Orlando health. And I was able to work in the pediatric hematology oncology unit there with clinical social work. And that year was so important for me. And so many reasons I remember loving going to work every single day. It was obviously free. It was an internship and interacting with the medical team, the holistic medical team in the pediatric hematology oncology world. These are kids with varying various diagnoses of cancer and also um, the hematological world. So kids with a lot of sickle cell and other um, issues would come through there. And so I loved going, my, my role was psychosocial and the, on the social work team. And I got to really spend a lot of amazing time getting to know patients and families, helping connect them with different resources. We had a lot of financial resources to help out in these difficult times, you know, whether it was helping to pay bills, electric bills or utility bills while the families were in long-term hospitalizations and also dealing with the financial burdens on their own of medical care or, um, you know, checking in with the family. This was my favorite thing, how, how, you know, how they were doing and having really deep, impactful and meaningful conversations during this time of trauma and grief and, um, overwhelm that they were going through. And so the bonds and the, the sacred ground that these parents allowed me in on and getting to know their children and their, uh, was, was phenomenal. And for me, my draw and my calling to medicine strengthened exponentially during that year, watching and being part of rounds and hearing the physicians talk about the patients and going over over everything from lab values to their, you know, how they were doing to their plans and assessments. And it was mesmerizing for me, you know, them dropping all the medical terminology. I knew, I knew in my soul that I wanted to learn how to speak medicine. It was like a foreign language, but one that I was just 
captivated by just completely enchanted. And I loved watching the dynamic of the nursing staff and the physicians and then being part of the holistic team with the social workers and the dietitians and the pharmacists and getting to sit down together and come up with plans that most honored the patients. And it was also in this year that I re realized my strength in contributing to the medical team from a psychosocial perspective and really t honing in on into that superpower that I have and connecting with people and what patients and families were willing to share with me and how then I could take that vulnerability and add it to the care team um, and help their overall treatment, help them be understood. And at the conclusion of that year, I, I actually, these scrubs um, are from Arnold Palmer and this dream was born in me, you know, to be a pediatric resident and go to pediatric residency at Arnold Palmer. And one of my mentors that I will forever be indebted for. She is a, she's an incredible pediatrician. And it also serendipitously happens that I met her as she was one of the mothers of one of the girls I got to coach for several years as, as a soccer coach. And I remember she gave me my first stethoscope, pediatric stethoscope. And I remember sitting outside of the bench at the parking garage and just being so overwhelmed with gratitude and the tears floated looking at that pink Littman pediatric stethoscope. And I have it to this day. I will always treasure it. And just being so grateful that someone, you know, at the height of her career and her expertise was willing, so willing to invest in someone who she could see was passionate about pursuing medicine. And I, I love and definitely echo that. That's how I feel about medicine is that we're always called to invest in and encourage the next generation. It's not an exclusive club that no one can get into. I mean, it takes a lot of hard work and grit and determination, of course, to become a doctor, but I feel that sharing that, um, love and passion and helping the next, the next group come along is always evolving and elevating medicine. And what, what we're truly here for is to elevate care and health and empower our patients and make things safer and better and healthier. And so I finished my master's in mental health counseling. And I also at the same time was pursuing a second master's in lifestyle medicine. And this was a new program that was really interesting to me that started at UCF and I got a graduate assistant research role there. And I worked with Weight Watchers and did some, you know, really cool research studies in that program and learned a lot about metabolism and exercise physiology and, and the different contributors to how lifestyle affects health. And unfortunately that program got shut down after two years for funding and also my graduate assistant uh, role. And so they pivoted me. They, I had a couple options for programs that I could transition into. And I chose healthcare administration, which for me, as someone who loves to learn was really wonderful because in a pre-medical pursuit of neuroscience, and then even in mental health counseling, I hadn't gotten a lot of exposure to business classes. So in that, in that role, I took finance and accounting and economics and a lot of different business courses. And I was one, actually one class shy of getting my master's in mental health. Um, I mean, mental health, healthcare administration, which are the people, you know, on the administrative side in the hospital. Uh, and the reason I didn't complete that is because I got into medical school and it was a, an internship that was a year long and I'm not compatible with me um, pursuing medical school. And so in this season, you, you can see, like, I never stopped learning and never and put, putting myself and paying, you know, I worked hard basically to pay for myself to go to graduate school. And I love it, loved it. And so I had taken the MCAT a third time and studied on my own this time and really just committed. I remember telling my parents and JD, my husband, and then um, boyfriend from college that this was still my path. This was still something that maybe everyone didn't understand, but it was just my calling. And my compass, my inner compass was telling me that I needed to continue trying. And I remember that resolve that I had and, and just, I lived in my, um, above the garage in my parents' house, like after college, I boomeranged back. And I remember studying so passionately and just trusting myself. And this time I took the MCAT and did well. And I applied broadly again, 
with all the different new things that I had, um, post-college, you know, and I think the, the new medical student, there are still medical students that, um, come straight out of undergraduate. Uh, but for me, that serendipitous path that led me into medical school really strengthened me and really, it was a spiritual submission where I remember having a conversation with God and saying, I understand that this, you allowed me to go through this season of adversity on my path to medical school, because it was important that I understand it wasn't the next step, but that this was a calling and that, that I was going to use medicine as a vehicle to serve other people and a ministry and a way to serve other human beings and souls. And that this was something, um, that was a gift. And so I remember this time not applying broadly because I was engaged to JD by this time we were going to be living in Tampa. That's where his job was. And so I remember applying to two schools. One was an MD school, USF in Tampa. And one was a, um, DO, a doctor of osteopathic medicine, which is what I am at LECOM, which is called Lake, which is stands for Lake Erie college of osteopathic medicine. And the mothership campus is in Erie, Pennsylvania, but there is a campus in Bradenton kind of Sarasota area on the West coast of Florida. And I did not get um, invited to interview at USF, but I did get invited to interview at LECOM. So this was kind of, you know, the Hail Mary for me. And I remember going to my interview and, you know, studying for that, but also just trusting that if this was meant to be, then I, I needed to show up as myself as authentically as possible. And I interviewed and I got the letter the weekend of my bachelorette party. And we were going to drive up to um, Charleston, South Carolina. And I remember finding out that I got into medical school and just that feeling of elation and that feeling of, for me, it was like getting my Hogwarts letter into, you know, wizard school. Like I was so excited. There was, this was something I had been pursuing now. I, so I graduated Miami in 2005 and it was like, I started medical school in 2010. So it had been five years of kind of pivoting and, but still passionately continue to pursue that path. And we got married in April of 2010 in the West coast of Florida. And then went on this amazing honeymoon to Bali. And I remember lying in bed the night before starting medical school, being really concerned, like how would medicine and medical school affect my marriage? I wanted to make sure that that was my priority and that pursuing this piece of me that felt felt like my calling would harmonize. And so I made that promise and commitment to myself that every day I would prioritize love and my marriage. And I've done that. And it really, we have benefited so much by my career in medicine. And for me, it's been a strengthening of our marriage, just seeing how he has supported me. And so I started medical school in July of 2010, and it was a two hour commute one, one hour each way from where we lived in Tampa. And I had this little blue BMW that we bought down in South Florida and I named it Merlin and he was my wizard of a car. And I listened to so many hours of medical lectures driving. And I would give myself like five to 10 minutes to do a free concert and have fun and get fun Starbucks drinks on the drives. And medical school was so amazing. I loved it. And I met a lot of amazing people. Uh, osteopathic school ended up being the best fit for me because it is holistic based and it, I learned a lot of hands-on skills. We learned a lot of osteopathic manipulation therapy techniques and get really comfortable with the musculoskeletal system. It's really strong in the musculoskeletal aspect of medical education, which for me as a pediatrician and now sports medicine physician too, was uh, very honoring. And I just absolutely loved medical school. First and second year, you spend a lot of time a lot of time in lectures and in preparing for your first board exam. And then your third and fourth years, you are in clinical rotations and mine were in St. Petersburg and mostly Western, um, coast of Florida, but they were all over as well. And I got to go back to Arnold Palmer, which was my dream institution. And I knew toward the end of medical school that I was going to pursue a uh, residency in pediatrics. You have to start deciding your third, fourth year where, what you want to go into, you know, some people go into anesthesiology, orthopedic surgery, everything. But for me, pediatrics, I had landed on that. I knew that was where I was called. And 
I got a lot of great interviews and I knew I wanted, so you can do residencies. This is another topic for another time. I can explain all of this, but in either there are osteopathic specific residencies and, um, MD allopathic specific residencies. And now they're merging them a lot more. Uh, but still at that time, when I was graduating in 2014, they were pretty separate. And I knew just for geographical reasons, uh, that MD residencies were attractive to me. So in order to be competitive for those, I had taken not only the osteopathic medical boards, but also the MD board. So every, every year for step one, step two, and then, um, I had taken extra board exams and studied for those and, and paid for those and everything. And, and, uh, yeah, so lots, lots of board exams and lots of studying lots of late nights, lots of willing myself through my legs, falling asleep. Cause I would always study just like I did in high school with my knees underneath me on the floor and, uh, sometimes reading out loud to myself. And anyway, so I got to interview at Arnold Palmer, which was, I had also done a, they call them audition rotations there and done really well in the pediatric ICU on my rotation which is also where my mentor worked and things were aligning, you know, for this dream institution for me. I remember my favorite interview question they asked me there. They said, if all the children were healthy and we didn't need physicians, what would you be? So essentially like trying to find out more about the person. And I said, without hesitation, a yoga instructor. And I still feel like I would be a yoga instructor. Mama's day. I love yoga. Uh, and so the match process is so interesting in medicine. It's kind of like, I did not go through sororities in college because I played soccer and was really, um, focused on that and, and academics, but you choose essentially all the places that you've interviewed, the different hospitals and programs that you've interviewed, interviewed at for potential residency spots, you rank those places in order of your preference. And then those institutions also rank who have, who they have interviewed. And there's a computer algorithm that matches that up. And when you enter into the match system, you are contractually bound to go to wherever you match. So you shouldn't rank anything or anywhere that you're not willing to move. And so when you have significant others and families involved, you can imagine that this is, this is literally how thousands, you know, of doctors find out where they're going to be doing their training, which their residencies are anywhere from three to seven years, if you're going to be in neurosurgery. And so I remember telling JD, you know, I can, I'm willing to become a pediatrician and I know I'll work hard and be 90 hour work weeks in, in hospital anywhere. And so where would you feel the most called and aligned with moving? What, what speaks to you the most? And I forgot to tell you, but during, during my, uh, I had also done an audition rotation at Tampa general for USF. And I did that in neonatology and where in Tampa, where we were living. And I, I loved that as well. And during that rotation, I remember I had gotten an email, email interview invitation to Hawaii because I had applied to Hawaii kind of on a whim. I mean, I knew I thought it would be interesting, but you know, I got the interview and we had gone to the interview in January. It was, uh, Martin Luther King day weekend of 2014. And I had gone on the interview and enjoyed it. Uh, and we had stayed in Honolulu and then on the North shore and the waves were 70 feet that weekend. I, I remember they were massive, literally at night sleeping, just sounded like a train. And we'd seen the whales jumping and we had made a promise to each other that there on the North shore, that if we were going to pursue Hawaii, that, that, that was where we felt like was calling us. I mean, I had grown, I'm a native Floridian born and raised all my life. I've been in Florida, central Florida, where I grew up and then Miami for college. And then the Tampa area where we moved after we got married. And so this was like a giant pivot from everything I had ever known, 5,000 miles from family and everything that I had ever known. JD grew up in the Bay area in California and, um, he's half Filipino and he, he definitely looks Hawaiian Hapa, they call it here. Um, and so this was me prioritizing, you know, love and marriage. And my dream really was realized in terms of if I wanted to go to Arnold Palmer and still, I will always hold, 
uh, a special place in my heart for Arnold Palmer. I think it's a phenomenal institution and I would have been so honored to do my residency there. Uh, but sometimes our dreams change, right? And when we are living into that and living into the energy, and I knew, I knew in our marriage, this was a good, a good choice and a good decision. So, and I had also loved my interview at MUSC Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston. And I've always been charmed by that city. I mentioned that I did my um, bachelorette party there. And I just think it is an amazing, colorful, vibrant, historical, foodie town. So we, we loved Charleston. And so that was also our, our top three essentially were Hawaii, Charleston, and Arnold Palmer. And so I was excited and hopeful that one of those three would choose me as well. But I remember submitting my rank list and being so excited and so nervous and ranking Hawaii first. And I, I kind of set JD with expectations saying, I, I don't have any connections there. A lot of people who had um, applied there or the people that had met had done audition rotations there, or, you know, they were more well-known to, to Hawaii. I didn't have any connections there. And understandably, Hawaii wants to choose residents that will likely stay and serve in Hawaii. I mean, if possible, they want to train people that are going to give back to the community and that will help elevate the care of children in Hawaii. And so somebody from Florida might not flag them as uh, somebody likely to stay. And so as time went on in fourth year and in March is match day, I remember meeting JD. Some schools have this big match day celebration, which is cool. It's kind of like the NBA or any kind of draft where you, you know, you're like, oh, I'm getting to go here and you open a big envelope, but my school did not have a big celebration. And so I remember meeting JD at lunchtime just outside the Air Force Base where he worked and sitting on this bench, looking out at Tampa Bay and opening up the email. You get this email on Monday of the match day week saying, did I match? Literally the title, the subject line is, did I match? And then you open it and like, it could say, no, you didn't match because some people don't match. And then you go into the scramble and it's this whole other process. But I remember opening that email and it was like, congratulations, you matched, which is such a relief. And then you have to wait till Friday to find out where, where you're moving. And so the title of the email that day is where did I match? And so I remember opening this email with JD and it said university of Hawaii. So we matched at the university of Hawaii, despite not having any connections. And it was just this very clear indication that God was like, you're going to Hawaii. And I remember JD jumping up for joy and I was so excited and we got our number one choice. And this is amazing. Crying with tears of excitement. And then that night I remember laying in bed and feeling so overwhelmed and crying and thinking we're moving 5,000 miles from everything I've ever known. And how is this going to work? And so I finished my fourth year of medical school and graduated and had um, graduation. It was this really cool time. And I think my medical school graduated the late, latest out of any one I've ever heard of. But so I had only a couple days after graduation to get things together with JD and we, we had to move to Hawaii. And that is another story for another day. I have like so many humorous stories with that. Uh, and we moved to Honolulu and literally looked up an apartment that we could rent or a furnished apartment in Seattle on our layover landed and had three days to get things done before I started my residency. And I started residency on the, uh, in newborn nursery. That was my very first rotation of first year. And I remember having all the pagers on me on July 4th and just being so thankful and excited that I was getting to live out my dream and that this was my calling to serve. And I spent three years at Kapiolani hospital for women and children in Honolulu. And despite, I think people who didn't know me, I was not sledding down rainbows and unicorns, but working really crazy hours in a hospital, learning how to be, to be a pediatrician, but I still, I loved it. I loved medicine. I loved speaking medicine. I loved learning about the patients. I loved, I loved everything about it. And I knew that this was, you know, aligned with not just something I wanted to do, but something I was called to do. And there were just so many moments of time where I've, I've shared here on Mama Mindset, where I connected with mothers specifically, you know, dating back to my time in social work and those moms who had allowed me in and, and, and some who I still keep in touch with it to this day, some of their children lived and some did not from the pediatric cancer that they um, suffered through or were diagnosed with. And 
these moms, you know, going into newborn deliveries and seeing moms for the first time or second or third time, or many times these multi, um, multi moms and seeing them in the ER or in the clinic, when I got to, um, build up my panel of patients and see children grow up and really get to know the family and then get to take care of their siblings and that these families were choosing me as their pediatrician in residency, you get to establish a panel of patients, which was really cool. And because I did fellowship also at university of Hawaii, I got, I had four years of seeing those, some of those babies turning into toddlers, turning into young children. Or if I started with them later in life, just watching them go through their teen years. And it was all such a gift to me. And it was becoming more and more apparent that I was, I loved interacting with the moms. And you've heard my story a little bit about how that conviction with me grew and grew and grew. And even as a young physician coming into medicine, I could see some of the limitations that were placed on me with my time investing in, in a genuine, authentic way that I wanted to with moms tapping into that superpower that I have. And then when I became a mom myself in my third year of residency, that's when I had my daughter, it was a whole new level. And I feel like my street cred went, you know, really up with the moms because I'm, I'm also a mom now. And just that level of, you know, being a pediatrician, but also being a mom and how, how being a parent changes you. And I think obviously helps me have a new level of empathy and compassion in interacting with my patients and their families. And I remember people telling me in pediatrics, you, are you sure you want to go into pediatrics? You have to deal with the parents. And I was like, I know I'm excited to deal with the parents. It's always a part of it that I've embraced. And I, I feel really gifted at meeting people in their time of crisis or grief or stress. And it's something that I, and I not necessarily enjoy seeing them in that position, but I enjoy, um, helping them unpack that and helping them come to a place of peace and helping empower them that they are the experts on their own children. And how can we, how can we collaborate and how can we work together? And that was always something that I was gifted at. And I think helped a lot in the clinical interactions that we had and something I wrote in my entrance, uh, essay explaining why I wanted to pursue pediatrics was that I, I love the simultaneous juxtaposition in children and in pediatrics of how children are extremely vulnerable, yet they're also so resilient. And that stuck with me, that phrase that I wrote. And, um, it is, it is so true. Children are incredible the way they can rebound from the most severe pathologies. And I have seen the sickest children in the islands of Hawaii and with the most severe diagnoses and all of the babies and children that I've been part of their care who have who have died, who have become angels. I have all of their names written on my heart and I carry the heaviness of all of those scenarios that I was a part of. And I'm so grateful to them for what they taught me. Uh, and I can, I, I can still picture every single one of them. And I've never been someone that doesn't take work home with them. I, that's just not who I am or how I'm built as a person. And I, it didn't impact, you know, I think that in medicine, they're concerned that that'll impact care that you deliver. And for me, I feel confident that I was always able to deliver high quality care and keep my, um, clinical mind sharp during scenarios and triage appropriately and do what needs to be done medically. But for me, allowing the empathic side of me to emerge in blend in seamlessly with who I am as a clinician was an important part of me. And I mean, there was a time when I suppressed that because they teach you, you need to do that. It's, it's taught in medical school and, and even in your training more as a protective factor. And sure. There's some boundaries that you probably, that, that are important to put up. And I learned those in counseling too, but for me, not denying my natural way of interacting with people and showing emotion and empathizing because I am a natural empath to a very high degree. And that is part of me. That is who I am. And that is what mama mindset is about is living into that and, and embracing that part of my genius. So that sometimes I couldn't all the way blend in or align with in my medical practice, or at least in a, in a traditional, you know, medical model of what we have today. And the more I let that free, it didn't suppress her, mute her or minimize her the more, the more alive I felt, the more vibrant and the more living into my purpose and the more effective I was with 
parents and families. And so I started trusting that more and more and more. And as I was nearing the end of my residency, I had for a long time planned to go into pediatric emergency medicine to subspecialize um, for three additional years in a fellowship program. And I had again, gone to Arnold Palmer, my dream institution. I was like, okay, well, I didn't go there for residency, but we can go back for fellowship. And so I had done a one month, uh, working in the ER during residency to help increase my chances of getting selected for fellowship and fellowship is even more competitive because there's less fellows and I had done really well. And it was actually during that rotation that I realized I was pregnant and I didn't take a test till we got back to Hawaii, but I just knew in my body, my period was late. And I just, this sense of suspense and like excitement because we had been trying for a long time. And I was 33 when I had Camden. So I think it was 32 when I found out. And I just remember being so excited during the rotation, but I did really well. And again, the possibility was there for me. Um, I mean, I never fully applied, but most likely I think I would have landed in a pediatric emergency medicine fellowship position at Arnold Palmer. And that would have been so magical. And, and for me, a dream come true, right? Because I love, love Arnold Palmer, but again, aligning with my life and my marriage and all the all of the things that make me unique and me and was, was Hawaii. Like I, when we had matched to Hawaii and when we had gone to Hawaii to our, our interview at first in 2014, I knew there was like a very spiritual connection to Hawaii. Um, for me, like the spirit of Aloha. And I, I knew when we were moving there that it was going to be like a forever thing. I just didn't know how to remedy that with moving 5,000 miles away. It was just like an overwhelming concept. Like I knew that we were going to resonate with it and that it was going to be our home and it wasn't really like a temporary thing. And so as we came through residency and anytime that residency was challenging, I would just look over and JD, just smiling, surfing, loving it, living his best life. And he was able to work remotely when we moved here, which was a huge gift and blessing. And so it was time for a pivot again. And the only fellowship that was really available for me along the lines of pediatrics was a sports medicine fellowship, which ended up being the most serendipitous, wonderful thing I could pursue because for one, it was one year. Secondly, it was in Hawaii. And also the little girl that I opened up this podcast talking about that had wanted to pursue orthopedics and being a team doctor and landing back in the athletic fields that I loved so much as growing up all through soccer and then playing at university of Miami and then coaching, just being back in that environment was so full circle. And so I remember applying and there was only one, it's only one fellow per year. And you can either be a pediatric resident or you can come from family medicine, or you can come from internal medicine or PMNR, which stands for physical medicine and rehabilitation. So it's competitive because it's drawing from four different medical specialties. And I matched into that position and it was right down the street. We got to stay in our house. And I remember celebrating my co-residents got me a green Hawaii shirt, uh, where the rainbow warriors. So gobos that I, um, still have and wear to this day. And I graduated pediatric residency three months, uh, later than my colleagues, because I chose to stay three months with my daughter. And I love that decision. So I started three months after with my fellowship, I went straight into it. I didn't have, um, a vac vacation because my return to leave was considered vacation for 18 months, just working straight into it. Um, but fellowship year was so wonderful. I loved it so much. I got to work at the student health center, university of Hawaii, taking care of college, um, age students and also faculty. And from a family medicine perspective, I got to do a lot more, um, caring of, you know, all age groups and just dealing specifically with a lot of sports injuries. And I was also got to be team doctor for all the different sports at the University of Hawaii. And I conducted a really cool research project that year on complementary and alternative medicine uh, and ancient Hawaiian healing practices. And by this time I was so entrenched and enamored with Hawaiian culture and getting to care for keiki. That's what we call them in Hawaii and learning, learning about Hawaii and the history of Hawaii. And it's the people and what the spirit of Aloha meant and how, you know, me as a Howley white person really, really accepted, um, by the local people for 
you know, in, in caring for their children. Cause that's a, a portal into, you know, a lot of intimacy and, and taking care of their families. And I was just so honored to do that. And it was such a, it, it, it is a small, big Island, you know, and now we live on, on Maui, but I remember going on a trip in residency to Molokai, which is a very small Island, less um, visited by many when you come to Hawaii and Molokai is actually where they had the leper colony for many years. Uh, and we did this hike on the East side in Halava Valley and we get to the end and it's, I mean, this is like a remote area. And I saw, and we saw like a local family and they recognized me because I was taking care of their cousin. Uh, child and um, like the immediate street cred that came with that. And just all, oh, it, it just humbled me every single time, you know, that these families trust me and the care yeah, of their children. And, and that just compelled me even further to continue studying, continue learning and continue being the best I, best I can be. And I worked so hard those 90 hour weeks and 28 hour calls. Like I didn't sleep on my calls. I didn't want to miss anything. And I wanted to be as present and, um, poised as I could for those families. And I'm so proud to claim that. And so honored that those children and patients were my teachers. They, they've taught me so much and my own children have been wonderful teachers uh, from a medical perspective as well. And so I completed my fellowship year, not without having, um, bilateral kidney stones. And I had to have a surgery, uh, which I'll talk about um, I think it's important to talk about uh, my own medical journey as well in another episode. Uh, but at the end of my fellowship year, I had basically through thousands of emails and lots of meetings had kind of forged a um, potential job opportunity with my, uh, with the University of Hawaii and um, Kapilani Medical Center for Women and Children to join the sports medicine faculty which I was really excited about. There's only a few pediatric sports medicine physicians in our state. And I, and I was really excited to be joining forces of them and, and hopefully learning more and continue to work with my mentor, uh, who I cherish and will forever, um, even still to this day. And, you know, things, the universe is always working out for my highest good. And as time wore on that role, um, was given to another physician who moved back to the state and she had a lot of experience and she's a great fit. Uh, and so they had offered me an alternative role, which was going to be opening an urgent care, which we, at that point had a pediatric ER in at Gabilani, but didn't have an urgent care. And we really needed it. The community really could benefit from a pediatric specific urgent care. And I thought that's wonderful. I'll see a lot of sports injuries as a sports medicine physician. This will really honor that part of my training. And I also love like the ER member, I was going to pursue pediatric ER. So I thought that could be great blending those two. Um, however, the, you know, I was, I was really excited about pursuing that and they wanted, they, they wanted to give me that honor of basically coming out of fellowship and having my own, you know, department. And that's a, this very prestigious job to be offered. However, I was going to be the only physician and running that and working nights, weekends, and holidays on repeat. Um, and there wasn't really any plans to, at that time to hire any other physicians. And so for me, the, the, there became a growing disconnect between, you know, looking at my one-year-old daughter who I had had during my third year of residency and then worked the first two years of her life very, very intensely with a residency and fellowship, studied for my pediatric boards during my fellowship year. I remember putting her to bed and then going to Starbucks and staying there till it closed at midnight and then getting up the next day and, and doing, doing all of that. And I treasured the moments that I had with her and, 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 uh, being a mom, it was my most sacred role, you know, being married and, and being a mom. And so putting her to bed at night and thinking that I wouldn't get that sacred time with her, that I would be working in this perspective role was truly eating up my soul and truly it was a sacredness and a submission in my soul. And I started asking myself the questions, is this, is this what I want? Is this, you know, you've kind of heard now, you know, through high school and then college and pre-med and three different master's programs and taking the MCAT three times and 
four years of medical school and three years of residency and one year of fellowship. And is this the, you know, the end of the line? And I, I'm obviously not someone who I'm willing to work hard and I know that there's sacrifices involved. And I really was looking forward to a, a long career in clinical medicine, but I started asking myself, you know, what are my priorities in life? And it was clear to me that bedtime and spending quality time with my family was where I knew I was home. And I didn't want to accept a job where that was, you know, taken from me and something that I had to sacrifice. It just wasn't something I was willing to sacrifice. And so I started having those conversations with the JD on our evening walks um, across Kapilani Park, this green space and to this beach, Kaimana Beach that we always went to when I, whenever I could get home before sunset. I started floating out those questions like, what if I turned on this job, which was preposterous to me at the time, you know, something I had worked thousands of hours and blood, sweat and tears to that hospital to get this opportunity all of these years, you know, all, all of this time, it was all culminating here. This was it finally going to start to be able to contribute and pay off student loans and, and everything after all this sacrifice. And after a lot of soulful conversations, it was clear that, and I, and I tried to negotiate, um, my role and even the salary and, and, and maybe just coming down to a little bit of part-time or just making it a little more of a livable situation for me, but, um, they were pretty clear on what they needed for that role. And I remember walking into the office in a September, sunny September day and declining that role graciously and with gratitude and walking outside the stairwell that I had run up and down thousands of times in residency and in fellowship for, for various clinical scenarios and walking out into the warm sunshine of the outdoor atrium area there. And that I had been in so many thousands of times and not having a plan, but feeling so much peace that I had just turned down something in order to open up an opportunity of what, what was next and what was next. I, I didn't know. I didn't have a plan for the first time. And it felt crazy not to have a plan, but also so liberating. And I never looked back from that. And I knew that it would cause me to have to pivot majorly because Hawaii is a small state and there's kind of limited opportunities from a pediatric perspective. Our big hospital is Kapilani where I train and we still, even on Maui, we'll send kids over there. And so I moved to Maui to pursue a um, urgent care job over here that also didn't end up breaking out for um, various reasons. And there were several, probably seven more clinical opportunities that came my way that people pursued before that crossed my path. And over the next couple of years. And I had my son when we moved to Maui, I, I started to realize that there was something, something else I was being called to do. And as I surrendered to that and struggled with it and, but also just was willing to listen, willing to get brave, willing to, I think I mentioned this before. Sometimes it takes extreme bravery to pursue and courage to pursue your dream and maybe even more courage to walk away from it when it's not serving you anymore. And it was that, that later, that part B of that statement, that was really a huge struggle for me, but also a, um, a baptism of my soul, you know, and, 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 and awakening of my inner artist and this humanitarian in me. Uh, and I started believing in her more and more and more. And that's when mama mindset was born. And I started to look at what I was already doing in my life, which was consulting and coaching and meeting and empathizing and holding space for all these mamas in my life. Ones that I knew and ones that were introduced to me and doing all these pediatric curbside consults that still come in all the time for me. And I started to believe I could start my own business based on what I, what I wanted to do, which was add value to other mamas lives and come and meet and come and have these life chats and bring my clinical office and my clinical expertise here and offer it to you and, and empower you the way that I did in a clinical setting, but that I feel like I can do in an even more exponential way here. Um, and to turn that stethoscope from your precious babies back onto your own heart and show you what I see in you, your strength, your superpower, your, your mama tuition, that, that superpower and your, that sixth sense that you have, that we all have, that I know I have an honor as a mama too. 
And so that is my story of how I became a doctor. And in many ways, I feel more like a doctor today and a healer living into who I am, this path that I've been on to get me here. I would change nothing about it. Nothing about the hard work and the adversity and, and, and just the mental and physical toll that it took on me, the sacrifices, the challenges, the, the mists, you know, missing, mi- missing a lot of things, missing a lot of, um, dates and other people, friends, weddings and baby showers and all of those things. That was all part of my path. And it led me here and it led me to the ability to now blend those two things, this, the science clinician physician side of me with the artist and the entrepreneur and the visionary and together that's my blend of being a healer. And that's, that's truly who I am, Anik, you know, and, and I feel more like a physician, a doctor today than sometimes that version of me that really poised version of me running, running around a hospital. And I'm grateful for her. And I, I, I'll always love clinical medicine and I keep my medical licenses active because I'm able, you know, to go and and actually I'm going to be doing clinical medicine, um, very shortly here, but I, I now feel the power in, in all of these things that I am all of those roles and I am safe to rise and I am safe to continue nurturing myself and nourishing myself so that I can show up as the best version of myself. And I can show up also imperfectly and unfiltered and unedited, like I do on these um, podcasts, these life chats, as I like to call them. And I thought doctor's day would be a really wonderful um, reason for me to kind of take a trip down memory lane and also shed some light and illuminate for you. My, my path that has led me here and how you as you mamas have been an inspiration in my life from my day, from, from so many different chapters from my social work chapter, working in pediatric hematology oncology, and then, um, coaching soccer. And then all of the thousands of mamas that I saw in the delivery rooms and postpartum units, and then taking care of your children when you entrusted them to my care. And it was that it was then, and then becoming a mama myself, that mama mindset was born. I just didn't really realize it until I had, I had the courage to surrender to it and just sit and, and ask, you know, and just be in prayer and say, okay, God, what, what do you have for me? What, how can I show up in the most authentic way and use the gifts that I've been given as a human being that were woven into my DNA? And how can I serve and add value to people's lives? And how can I be the version of healer that I was created to be? And mama mindset came from that, came from that place of surrender and submission. And so it is with great joy and great pleasure and, and flow that I get to sit down here and be me and show up as me as a healer and as a doctor. And so I honor myself as a doctor today. I honor you as a healer and physician, really pediatrician. That's where the term momatrician for me comes in, in your own home and together the healing capability of mamas everywhere is, is massive. And that feminine energy that divine ability to empathize and have radical compassion for others is limitless. And mama mindset is all about honoring that and, and helping you see that within you that already exists within you. It's already, you, you were born with it. And leaning into that, believing it, knowing it and choosing it every day is your path forward. And I look so forward to our paths forward together and how, how they blend, how they've been blending since my days in the hospital. And now here in this space that we've created with mama mindset. So I thank you so much for being here for celebrating doctor's day with me and for me getting to come here. My dream job was literally getting to wear scrubs every day. When I would, when I would think about like, what would my dream job be wearing scrubs every day. And so that's why you'll see me wearing scrubs on here because it was my dream job. And I, I created the dream job that I wanted in mama mindset. And so I actually, as a doctor's day present to myself, I'm ordering 
scrubs with my name on it and mama mindset emblem. So that'll be fun to share when they come in. And anyway, I wish you a beautiful day is the healer that you are the healer in me sees the healer in you. And thanks again for celebrating doctor's day and this special episode of the mama mindset podcast. Aloha mamas.